My name is indeed Rob. I work for that company there and have done for six or seven years now, which is impressive for anyone who's known me before that period. I'm quite kind of hopping around the place. Visit the website and be amazed at the buzzwords uh, one of the co-founders can squeeze onto a single page. Um, but essentially what we build is uh, bespoke media distribution systems, uh, doing encoding and delivery, both on demand and, um, and real time, well, as real time as you can, for things like sports betting, TV, and nonsense like that. Um, I guess the key things really is it needs to be high, it's high availability to the best, we, best, of our, best of our abilities and the best of our clients' abilities, because it is TV after all. And um, there's a lot of orchestration involved, and Erlang has proven itself to be pretty useful for us to that end. Um, but that's starting to show its problems now. Uh, the code base is over a decade old, written by a couple of ex.NET developers who've, le who've learned Erlang on the go, um, and us who've joined and also learned Erlang on the go. Um, but now have over a quarter of a million of lines of Erlang just sat there being used by nearly all of our clients. Um, very big set of core libraries to be able to do us to our jobs. And about 30,000 lines of code per client sat on top of that to get by handling orchestration and auctioning between various cloud providers and um, doing the actual work of encoding itself. And we've got fairly rich front end experiences, I mean, comparatively for our industry anyway. Um, if you've ever worked in the media industry, you'd know that's not really saying very much, which is good because we haven't got to do a lot of work for our clients to get very excited about a very simple UI. And we've, um, we've gone through a front-end bit of journey, really. When I, when I joined the company, everything was Ember, and Ember in the worst possible way. You've ever seen those two-way data flows, everything bound to something else, and data just flying every single direction you can possibly imagine, and code apps everywhere, and HTML and JavaScript arbitrarily <laughs> separated all over the place. And, it was pretty atrocious, and I very quickly switched that across to React, which at the time was fairly new, because as again, over half a decade ago now, and React was nice, one-way data flows, markup and JavaScript tightly put together where it needs to be. I don't care if that's controversial. Is it controversial still, JSX? I don't know. It's a sensible thing, isn't it? Um, it's a standard. Though. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad it's a standard. JSX is wonderful. Um, but it's still JavaScript, so let's move on from that. We went on to Elm. Elm is nice. It's a bit like Play-Doh. Um, you know, you can build things with it, but at a certain point, um, you kind of stop wanting to. Um, ma mainly, the problem with Elm is if you want to actually build real systems, you, you kind of want to start building your own packages, which means using a package manager, which isn't very good. You can't link to GitHub repos unless you use submodules, and it all starts getting a little bit unwieldy. And also breaking out of the box that Elm inflicts upon you. Um, isn't really possible, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Again, Play-Doh is probably right for us at the time. Um, Play-Doh is no longer right for us now. So now we are on Halogen and PureScript on our front ends, and the world is wonderful. And we are now building our UIs in PureScript, and that's wonderful. We have a similar story on our back ends with Erlang, except it's just <laughs> Erlang all the way down. Um, now, obviously, there's Erlang, and there's Erlang. You know, um, here's Erlang with a record of no particular information in it. Here's a function that takes one of these do's and does some calculation. And here's Erlang properly annotated with types, so you can run things over that and check stuff. So, you know, coolness can be an integer or tuple. Um, it could be an integer or a record, and obviously you can pick things up there. And using tooling inside um, the Erlang ecosystem, we can obviously use these to navigate when we're making changes across our code base, which as previously described is quite large. So we've got a large code base and because of that we've changed the way we write Erlang to best leverage both the compiler and the tools available to us. Now the problems become apparent with the tools in Erlang with code bases of this size. Um, this is a picture of me running Dialyzer on my laptop. Um, it's not good for my battery, it's not good for my sanity, and it's actually a bit of a waste of my time. Keeps my hands warm, though, which is good. Um, so obviously, you know, we can get quite far by adding types on top of Erlang and using the compiler and tools to guide us through our changes, but it does start showing limitations eventually, especially with code bases the size of ours. So enter this chap here. He's, he's called Nick, and he... He went to university and did actual learning, and um, as part of that learning, he wrote a compiler for PureScript to Beam. And that went on to Reddit a few years ago, and everyone got very excited. I think there was a post on White Hacker News or the Orange Place 
Jimmy mentioned or whatever, and that got, everyone got very excited and kind of didn't really go anywhere, um, which is sad for us because we saw this happen and went, wow, that's relevant to our interests. A compiler from PureScript to Beam, that's, that's clearly useful for us. Um, but nothing really happened with it. So we did the logical thing, which is we hired Nick um, two years after this fact, because, well, if we're going to start writing PureScript, we should probably hire the guy that wrote the compiler to Erlang. Um, this bit, I'm not really sure, but there's profit involved somewhere in this process. Um, we now have the guy that wrote the compiler working for us and helping us with all our PureScript, which is, which, is, which is nice. Now, why PureScript? Well, as mentioned, we're already writing our front ends in PureScript. It's a fine history of doing things like this. You've got Clojure and Clojure Script. You've got C Sharp and Silverlight. Um, Java and JavaScript. That's a joke, sorry. No JS and JavaScript. Ha, 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 yeah. Um. <laughs> I guess the key things really are we get stuff for free. Um, because we're using a language that already exists rather than using something that's been invented for the Beam, uh, our package manager exists already. It's called PSC package, and you've got all the nice types around that, like spaghetti and doll and whatever. Um, there's existing packages written in PureScript that we can just go ahead and use right now. OK, then, <coughs> then adding to our package sets, but that's OK. Things like editor tooling already exists. So if you're using Emacs, you've got a wonderful, rich experience for editing PureScript. If you're using Vim, you've got an experience for editing PureScript. Um, it does exist. And of course, tooling exists for doing type-based searches and such through the packages that exist in PureScript. So there's quite a powerful case here for just jumping in and using this stuff, because all you have to do is write the compiler, and everything else kind of follows. And of course, um, the compiler has been written by Nick, it's been done already. So that's great. Hire him, get all this stuff for free. And of course, on top of that, all our Erlang tooling still works. And I'll talk about that soon. Well, obviously, for the usual definition of works. Anybody who uses Rebar 3 on a day to day basis with any code bases of real size will tell you that it's not without its rough edges. So, very quickly, I'll do some sales pitch comparisons. This would be where a 101 talk would end. I'd say, look how shiny this pure script is, and just walk off the stage, and everyone would think it's amazing. But there are further demos to come that will obviously change everyone's minds on that. So, everyone's familiar with... Um, does that work OK on that screen? Yeah, just about. I'm just going to quickly go through some Erlang and PureScript comparisons, looking at the happy path only, and just say, this is what it looks like. Isn't it lovely? Um, so there's an application written in Erlang, and here's the equivalent application written in PureScript. Can I zoom out from that? I can. There we go. Beautiful. Isn't that pretty? That's pretty pretty. Here's a supervisor written in Erlang. And we have various modules being started up, and there's some various inputs to those modules, like web port over here being taken as config. Types, who needs them? Um, just pull them out and put them in places and hoping for the best. Very little way of verifying this, quite messy. OK, let's go look at the um, peer script. Here we have a similar or identical supervision structure, where we have typed arguments coming from config and being passed into supervision children with type checking on these startling functions over here. And the compiler will pick up if you pass the wrong things into the children. But the original API is still represented inside the pure script. So the documentation for Erlang still carries across this quite tidily. I assume this is largely familiar and legible to most people. And it is a supervisor tree. It's written in pure script. I mean, what is there to say, really, other than that? I'm not really sure. Um, and of course, um, gen servers themselves. This is a gen server in Erlang. I keep zooming out and zooming out until um, it's so small you can't see it. Um, can anyone see that at the back? Or should I go, are we still OK? Cool. I can probably choose a different set of colors if that doesn't work out for you. Um, so we have a start link and an init over here. There's an input, which is the connection string. And then we call start link and pass the connection string in here. And there's an init over here. Again, no real type checking involved, just passing things in and lists and such and hoping for the best. If I want to call into this gen server, I need to um, write a function which calls gen server call and passes in this tuple over here, then match on this and another function down here. And again, hope these two things link up. Again, it's quite difficult to verify that. The two things are separate. I'm going to call this gen server, passing in these things, and hope that gen server knows how to intercept those and do things with them. OK, I guess it works for some people. Um, 
here is a code gen server in PureScript. So I've got some typed start args and a typed state, and my start link types those, takes those typed start args and returns the start link result and passes in those args to my init over here, which is in gen server context, which is also typed, type checking, returns a connection, returns a typed state, that's type checked as well. Here's my if can create function, which given a, an, a book, returns an effect of either string or book, which does a call on that gen server, which takes a call back, which is also typed, do things with the state, and returns a type state again. So all of this is now verified and close together, and there's no arbitrary functions this far apart with no type safety at all. It's all very close and very legible and very shiny and very nice. So from this demo here, I'm sure everyone now loves Pure Earl and wants to go start using it rather than Erlang. And I can't blame you. It's very pretty. Do you think it's really pretty? I think it's really pretty. Yeah, quite. Um, it has, yes. I actually like to not use the M word. Um, I just say it's, it's an effect and don't worry about it. Um, shh. <laughs> Much easier. Right, so pure old is a no-brainer, end talk here. What time is it? So I've got 20 minutes left to go, so I may as well carry on going. I was actually hoping I'd just go so slowly that this would be done by now. Um, let's just actually keep doing demos and just show you how it works underneath the hood, and we'll get a better sense of what pure role actually gives us and what it doesn't give us and how things actually tie together. Um, I saw, like, probably... 20% of the audience does PureScript already, so to you, this will all make most sense already because it's very much like the JavaScript world, but um, the rest of it will be not like that. So, I have a canned folder of demo over here, uh, demo two, there we go, this is good. And I've written no Erlang in here, I've deliberately kept the surface area of this demo very small. The key components of a PureScript application are this PSC package.json, which everyone should be familiar with from the Erlang world. The difference being that our package set comes from the Pure Role organization rather than the PureScript organization. And there's a couple of extra modules available for us who want, for example, like Erl lists or whatever. Let's not worry about that just now. I've got a make file over here which is going to invoke PSC package sources and then pipe that into Perse compile and compile any Perse file it finds in my sources folder. I'm going to leave this so we haven't got to gaze upon make any more than we have to. My vim is hanging. That's lovely. Thank you very much. And I'm going to open up main.perse. There we go. Here's main.perse. I've got an error because module prelude is not found. I'm actually going to be really brave and... Um, run make over conference Wi-Fi. <laughs> Look at that. There we go. Beautiful. So that's pulled down all the core packages and dumped them in .psc package. I'm actually not going over conference Wi-Fi. I'm tethered to my mobile phone. So not only am I running Arch Linux and connected to a projector over some weird X-Rander hackery, I'm also tethered to my mobile phone on Linux as well. Year of the Linux desktop, this probably is not. Um, but it is working. So I've got an output directory over there from compiling my single beam, uh, so my, my single dot purse. What's in that output directory? Gosh, quite a lot of things. So Nick has sat down and braved the world of writing all these standard modules in PureScript slash Erlang. And um, when you pull down preludes and such, these things now exist, and they get compiled into well, let's go and look what they compiled into, shall we? Let's go look at our demo app, demo um, module, which is called main, main app.ps.erl. So, some things of note here. Modules compiled by PERS get compiled into Erl, nothing else. So that means there's a two-stage compilation process involved if you want to use PureScript. The first one is take PureScript, turn it into Erlang. The next one is use the rest of your tooling pipeline that you ordinarily would to take those files and make beams out of them. Um, that's a practical thing that I, I guess he's done because it's easier than the alternatives. I would imagine a better technical solution would be go directly to beam, but that's not how it currently works. And that's fine because it fits our needs. So modules end up with an at PS on the end of them. Um, I believe it was an underscore at one point, but then you get clashes. So no one seems to use at in their module names, but it's, it's a valid atom. So um, that's what we have here. 
it means every bit of tooling that doesn't expect an app breaks and falls over. That's a tooling problem. The tooling is wrong. Um, obviously, obviously, there is no export. I've not written any code yet, so it's just an empty module with nothing in it. And a pile of compile shadows, because um, the Erlang generated is not necessarily the Erlang one would write. Fair enough. Let's write a function. Let's just do that. Let's just jump in and say, gosh. There's a heavily complex function, isn't there? There's enterprise code. <clears throat> now, if I just quickly reload my editor over here, I would expect. Right, there we go. So, um, Vim's launched Purs IDE in the background, and my IDE support actually now works for compiling this file and doing type checking and such. So, um, if I get rid of Prelude, it's going to complain because it has no idea what plus is. And I get that in my editor for free. Again, using PureScript because, because I get the tooling for free. No one's done, done any extra work to make that work. It just does, which is nice. So let's go and compile that. And open that file again and just see what we've actually got. There you go, there's our function button Erlang. That's, so, you know, it's not terribly complicated. Obviously, if you open any of our real gen servers, it, it, it looks hairy. Um, as a general rule, you don't open these files anyway, so it's okay. You'll notice that there's file directives in here to actually make sure the compilation errors turn up in the right place in your PureScript code anyway. So, when you, I'd say your runtime errors, sorry. So, when things crash, you get a call stack, and the call stack normally tells you roughly in the PureScript where it actually happened. So, generally, you haven't got to go digging through the generated Erlang. Um, I actually found a bug in Rebar 3 relating to that, which I had to patch. I have contributed to Rebar 3. I've done my duty, which is, which is nice. I'm proud of that. Um, so anyway, I'm going to generate some beams out of that and actually run. <laughs> Apparently, I don't have to do that anymore. So I'm going to run make beams, and that just runs the Earl C compiler over the, any, all the Earls in that folder, and gives me, hopefully, a list of beams in that folder here. Yeah. So these are your ordinary beams that you'd ordinarily have in Erlang world. And if I do an Erlang PA of that beams directory, I can load that module. And I can call that module, um, what's I call that function again, add. And it, as you can see, it's just an ordinary function in the Erlang world at that point. So that's nice, because it means I can write functions in PureScript that I can call from Erlang. That's not necessarily something you'd do manually, but obviously a lot of APIs do like to take MFAs and such. And if you're working against legacy Erlang, you can pass in your PureScript functions, and they'll just work as you'd expect them to work in the Erlang world, which is quite handy. So you can actually write gen servers like that if you want to. You can sit there and you can write your start link and your handle infos and such, and cross your fingers and hope for the best that the callbacks match up. And um, it's pretty ugly, but you can do it because they're just functions at the end of the day, which is nice. That was it, wasn't it? That's probably it. I guess I'll do a quick thing here as well. Um, let's say I want to base64 encode some strings or something. That's just there's a default library in Erlang called Base64, and it can encode strings. And I want to call that from PureScript. Let's quickly cover that now, because it's the easiest thing to do. I'll do that? Yeah, I'll do that now. Why not? So next to files like these, the purse files, I can quite happily go main.erl. So I've got a pair of files here. And this is my foreign function import file. And I'm going to give that a module name of main at foreign. That's nice, isn't it? It's a lovely name, more ats involved. And I'm going to export a function called uh, base64, which takes a single directly. I'm trying not to use too many edit, edit shortcuts, um, I don't want to confuse anybody. Um, right, base64, encode, my import, thank you very much. So, I've got a function there written in Erlang, and I can actually export that to this world over here by typing foreign import base64. And honestly, it takes a string and returns a string. Now, this is, this is relying on me to be honest here. Um, being, um, you know, um, I could lie what this thing takes, and no one's going to check. 
Um, but obviously, once you're in pure script world and you've got this right, any bit of pure script relying on this will also be correct, which is good. You're not going to get a runtime error. So the, the question is, um, for the benefit of the recording, is if I happen to make this string to int, the compiler's not going to complain because it doesn't know any better, base 64, whatever. Um, and it's not going to complain at runtime either until I try using that in some way. And then you'll get a runtime error. Absolutely, yes. Um, generally, when you try and serialize that across the wire, things will get pretty unhappy. Um, Generally, just don't do things like that because it's daft. But I will show you later, it's actually quite handy to lie about the types or at least use opaque types underneath the cover. Um, and I'll, I'll show why that's useful afterwards. But anyway, um, that just creates me a function that calls a function. It's not terribly exciting, but if I do a, a main over here, <coughs> which is of type effect unit, and um, I don't know, let's just do a. Probably console, I imagine, and it's probably debug. Who knows? Let's just let's just try. I always like typing pure unit for some reason. I don't know why that is. It just really makes me feel happy. Oh look, unknown type effect. Well, I'll import that. Unknown module console. Well, I'll import that. Oh, oh dear, I can't import it because I haven't actually added to my. No, it is there. It's probably just not called console, or it's called something else for debug. Did I? It's OK, because I wrote notes on an iPad over here, because I'm really professional. So it's, ah, it's log. Obviously, I don't use console in um, real applications. I use logger or something like that. There you go. So I can import um, either one of those two things over there, and now all the compiler errors are fixed. So that's quite nice. My tooling is actually working very nicely in pure real world, and I haven't done any extra to make that work which is nice. So I'm just going to go ahead and make that. Uh oh Have I done a big boo-boo somewhere? Probably. Mm. That should have just worked. <coughs> might have a little bit. It's not, I promise you. I can't ask anyone for help, can I? Because um, this is, this is, um, <sighs> wow, it's not like me to have demo fail like that. I'm actually completely lost over here. I don't know what I've done. Um, sorry? Yeah, it's, Front module is missing. It's not missing. I can I can assure you. Well, I th I thought it might be that, but um, my documents over here tell me that lowercase is um, fine. Um, this should be uppercase, though. I'm almost certain of it. Funny value is not defined. The front module for module main. That's a, nice, that's a nice error, isn't it? I mean, um, there's a base64 function over here. It's called string. It takes one function, turns another function. And I've exported it over here. In shouldn't, that shouldn't matter. Well. You certainly can name it Bisty 4 because in my here's what I prepared earlier, that's exactly what I've got. And in fact, you know what? This is why we do things like this. We go talks over here and we go to pure script um, downloaded. Ah, there you go, look at that. And we open up demo two. We check out master where all the changes actually exist over here. We open demo two. I'm a consummate professional. I run main over here, and then we open the code to see what I did wrong. 
Um, there's a main.earl. There's a main foreign. There's an export, basically 401. Can anyone see the difference between those two things? I can't see the difference between those two things. I might just. I've, I've changed that in the other one too. I, it's all capital. Well, who knows? I can only imagine I'm being daft in some way, and um, who knows? Anyway, let's just pretend I wrote that code correctly first time, and I'll run my make beams here. It goes without saying things like hot loading work in this environment too, still. So if I ran that compilation process and reload the module, the new code would appear inside that module automatically, um, which is nice. There we go. Obviously, I can't actually use that function now because I'm not exported in that example, but um, so there you are. I'm using Erlang code from pure skipper code. I really hope I work out why I'm wrong there, because my next demos all kind of revolve around using foreign function imports. So um, hopefully I get it right next time. Who knows? <coughs> Let's go back to that. As a team, I'm sure we can work this out. I mean, there's a, a room full of clever people here. You'd think that would get this, wouldn't we? Um, so that is. Our demo just here. We have sys, we have main.earl, we have main.purse. We have main.earl over here. I'm exporting a list of functions, one of which is base64 slash one, which exactly what the thing's called over here. And then a function which takes that one function and returns that. I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I blame the demo gods. I'm just going to leave it at that and hope they don't interfere with my next demo. I think let's just go with that, shall we? Let's not waste any more time on that. It's really easy and works all the time and never works inexplicably, inexplic doesn't work for no reason. So, PERS merely transforms PERS into Earl and secondary complex steps are required. Now, this is actually useful in some ways because it means whatever tooling you normally use for your Erlang, you can using for your pure script. Obviously, some people like to use Earl.muk, some people like to use Erlang.muk, and some people use Rebar.3. Rebar They're all dreadful in their own little ways, and um, you know, it doesn't really matter which one you pick, whatever your poison. The modules generated are no different from Erlang modules, and side by side is just side by side code, it's just code. And hot loading and the usual Erlang features are all still gloriously possible. <coughs> Let's talk about legacy code, which means using foreign, for, foreign file imports, and just hope for the best, shall we? Um, this is actually the, I guess, the biggest demo um, we have going. So I've got a legacy, <coughs> legacy in, um, code base here. Um, it's very important functionality. As everyone knows, PMs like to ask for pony ponies. Um, so we have a create pony here, taking in a name, which turns a map, which is heterogeneous. I've got a name, which is maybe a string, who knows? And I've got is awesome, it's always going to be true, it's Boolean. Let's, that's, of course, they're always awesome, aren't they? Um, we have only ponies not awesome, which the function takes a list of ponies and returns an environment awesome. And we have a lovely function here called write ponies to file. So a very complicated bit of legacy code that I cannot possibly rewrite in PureScript because it's too much hard work. And I need to reuse this from my PureScript land. I've managed to cover some use, use cases here in the simplest way possible. Let's go ahead and just start writing some code. So I've got main.purse over here. <laughs> <laughs> never been compiled again. So let's just go and do that. Um, demo three. Once again, pulling packages over the Wi-Fi. You know, if demo gods were going to smite me, you'd think they'd do it here, wouldn't you? Rather than just arbitrarily getting in the way of my imports. That, that is, it's so subtle that I cannot see it after looking, comparing the work examples on two different screens. Um, I really hope that I work this out. Um, right, well, I mean, <coughs> I guess the cool key thing to do here is follow the pattern you would ordinarily with legacy code. I've got a module here called cool.earl. And what you'd ordinarily do in pure script world when le wrapping legacy code is create a module called cool.purse. And you create another module called curl.earl because you can have too many cools, can you? Um, one's uppercase, one's not, that's nice. So I'm going to create a module here, module cool where, I'm going to import prelude because you kind of need it. <coughs> I'm going to set about importing those functions. So let's go and look at what these functions actually look like. 
Crate pony. Let's, let's assume names are strings, shall we, and not an atom or something like that. I think it's reasonable to assume that we're probably working with strings over here. I'd create a function called create pony, and I'd take the string, and I'd return a, ah, what am I going to return here? There's a question. You can't represent heterogeneous maps in PureScript. You can't have a, a, a list or a map with different key, types of key-value pairs in it. It's just it's not going to happen. So I'm going to have to create an opaque type for this pony. Thankfully, there's something I can do. So I can say foreign import data pony, which is of type type. There is something called a pony, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring it out in this API. And when I pass it around, it's a pony. And PureScript has no idea what's inside that. It just knows it's something called pony. That's fair enough. If I wanted to access the name or the variable, I had to add functions to do that. Pony name and pony is awesome. Fair enough. But that means I can do create pony, give me a pony. Yeah. Which obviously needs to be a foreign import as well. <coughs> I need to go and create that um, module over here. So here we go again. Let's just hope it works this time, shall we? So far, so good. Right. Great pony name. All I gotta do is call the legacy module with the variable and return that map. So we're lying about the type, we're just saying it's a pony, don't worry about it and getting on with life. Fair enough. I'm not going to bother running this, because I know that I spent so much time trying to fix the last one that um, it's not going to really um, show very much here. Let's just try and cover the bases a little bit. Um, all right. Are any ponies not awesome? Well, this is an interesting one, because it takes a list. And it doesn't take a pure script list, it takes an Erlang list, and the difference between those two things. A pure script list is a set of um, const data structures, and an Erlang list is a fundamental data type in Erlang. So, I need to use one of them. I'm going to call it Erl list. Actually, I was going to call it list, I'm going to import that thing. It takes a list of pony and returns a bool. Hang on, unknown type list. Let's try and import that, shall we? I've got a few options. I can use the PureScript list, I can use the Erlang list. Obviously, it's the Erlang list. So import that over there. And you'll see immediately we have modules for all of the Erlang data types available for us in PureScript land. So when you're writing native PureScript, you'll normally avoid using the Erlang data types. When you're interfacing with legacy Erlang, you'll use the Erlang data types. And there are functions to convert between the two. In general, you don't need to use them because you're either writing PureScript or you're writing Erlang. You're not generally mixing the two too much. But um, there we go. Oh, is it Boolean in PureScript? Of course it is. There we go. Cool. And that's nice and simple as well because Oh, any p pony is not awesome. Ponies. Because I have an Erlang data type there, I can just, set, I can just pass it in, use it exactly as it is. And that will just work. Now, the last one. Last one's slightly more interesting um, because it has a side effect in it. My VIN just crashed. That's amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I've talked about I've talked to you about Emacs many times. Um, right. Anyway, I've got a side effect over here. They are file write file. I need to express that somewhat differently. Generally, functions inside PureScript are pure. The clue's kind of in the name, really. And that means I can't. I could lie here and say, actually, you know what? Um, write ponies to file, takes a list of pony, and just returns a boolean. I could lie and just call that file dot write, and no be any the wiser. It's a little bit cheeky. You shouldn't really use side effects in pure script unless you have to tell the above world that you're doing it. So this needs to be an effect. I'm going to leave that as a boolean for now, and I'm going to talk about error handling once I've done this function, because I don't want to muddy the waters too much. What is an effect? Well, the M word was used earlier. 
Um, <laughs> I'm not going to use the M word. Um, it's just a function wrapping another function in this particular case. And that's literally what it's going to be underneath the hood. It's how they compile. Um, if I want to write ponies to file inside my foreign function import over here, I'm going to return a function from my function, which is the effect. And then I'm going to actually call ponies to file ponies. And that's all there is to it when doing side effects. So you have to be, be cognizant when you are, oh, full stop, full stop there, honestly. You have to be quite cognizant when you're writing FFIs about whether you have side effects or not. And you need to be honest with yourself about whether side effects or not. A call to a gen server is a side effect. You're calling a remote process. You know, um, you can't pretend it's otherwise. You'll, you'll, you'll break the system further down the line. So generally, if you're doing anything that involves I.O., whether it's internal or external, you need an effect around it. And that means sticking a function around the code and everything kind of working as you'd expect. And write ponies to file. Rather than write a, a compiler code that uses this, just realize I need a file name for this, so it's not going to work at all. If only the Erlang would complain about that. Um, <coughs> that's got two in it. And my pure script needs to also then have a string. Cool. This will compile. Probably. Demo three. That's a useful error. Exports of uncoid arity three, but imported a coid arity two. Export must have less than or equal arity. Well, I've definitely messed that up, haven't I? Let's go have a look. You put a three instead of a two, didn't you? I put a three instead of a two, and it's a two. I was looking at the return value and going, that's a that's a that's a that's a value I have to care about. Let's find the code. That should be a two. Thank you, compiler, for checking whether I was doing things right or not. The following values, oh, here we go again. I'm not defining the foreign module for module cool. I think you find it is, it's just there. I think I'm messing on my export function. Is it? It's not, no, it's not. Thank you. Hey, we have a compiling thing this time, which means if I go and do, well, make beams as well. Let's go and do that, shall we? Otherwise, there's nothing to actually run over here. Gosh. You know, I write pure script every single day for work. It's literally my job, and I still can't do it when it's on a projector. This is really quite terrible. OK, that's right at the very bottom of the screen, and I can't control L to the top, apparently. I'm so sorry about that. I have to just press return once I've done, once I've done the result. I can call things like create pony. Well, I can't actually because of the module. I called it cool at ps. Cool at ps dot create pony. There you go, right. And you can see there that the types underneath there still, I've got a map of the things in it. And PureScript can pass that round quite happily, but also I can pass it to Erlang still. Everything's fine and great. If I would create another, if I actually stick that in a variable and uh, I can indeed still use my um, exported X. Um, Oh, any pony is not awesome. No, Rarity is not awesome, though. She's fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I'd need more types for that. Oh, any pony is not awesome, false. That makes perfect sense. There's no Boolean trap going on here. Um, and indeed, I can, write, I, can write, I can write these ponies to file. So um, let's just quickly do that, shall we? I didn't call that ponies to file, did I? What did I call it, people? It does, doesn't it? File name. 
Gosh, you guys are on the ball. That's great. Let's call it file.txt, even though that's a complete lie. Ah, oh, what's this? It's a function, because I return a function. So you're going to be you know, watch out for this when you're passing things around from PureScript to Erlang. And there are helper functions to help you with this kind of thing to make these effect functions something that Erlang needs to know about. Um, but obviously, I can just wrap that in brackets and invoke that function. And now everything's written to file. So let's quickly go back to this again, shall we? Um, and very quickly, because it's important to note. I returned effect boolean there, and that's not a file write file returns. File write file, if you just keep, excuse me writing some Erlang, it's a PureScript file. File the write file can return an OK, or it can return an error reason, where reason can be an atom or a number of things. You can represent that inside Purell if you want to, inside your file import. And best practice is generally to try and mirror the API exactly. So here I'd actually say it's an effect and it's either an atom or it's a file write return result. And then you have to go sit there and you've got to define um, data file write that equals error string or error int, and so on and so forth. And you have to pass these constructors into that function and return them, so on and so forth. And it gets pretty burdensome. Um, <coughs> when interfacing with Erlang libraries that are not the core ones and you're, not, and you're writing something other than a thin veneer, it's quite tempting to not do this and return something more pure scripty and coerce everything to strings or um, uh, just a list one of uh, um, something from an ADT. And that's all possible and allowed and fine. It's kind of up to you, and it's also kind of undiscovered ground as it currently stands. Our approach so far when writing our code is to try and represent the errors inside our bindings to legacy code and handle those errors in PureScript, which means our PureScript doesn't tend to crash because it's, it's PureScript. So why would it ever crash? You have types being checked. Now, of course, the Erlang philosophy is let it crash, so you've got a bit of a dichotomy going on here. And it's kind of up to you where you draw the line between those two worlds when writing your bindings between the two environments. There's no best practices exposed for this stuff yet. It's kind of which one do you feel like? Um, I like to handle errors and not crash. That's just me. I like to log into our servers and see an empty crash log. It makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. Um, some people don't mind having a crash.log um, as long as the system carries on working. That's OK. We once had a bug in production where we were crashing every 10 frames we received and no notice for six months until <laughs> our log directory ran out of space. Um, no one was looking at it, basically. And this isn't kind of working because the message got, the message got resent and the frame got processed. So who cares? Um, probably not best practice, let's put it that way. Um, so anyway, in summary, FFI is for importing think it's in code. You, there's some limitations. You can't represent the heterogeneous types very well. That's OK. Um, make them opaque. Don't worry about it. They're actually useful in between. If you look at... Um, my OTP example that I had out earlier. Very quickly open my supervisor over here. This ends up being a list of children with different types. But to pure script, they're just child. Once you've finished building this child here, it's just child. I hide those types in the FFI underneath the hood. It's convenient because the underlying representation of the API has a list of random tuples that kind of just fit together. So once you've done the type checking at this level, there's no real reason to try and keep those types around. So they're hidden, so you can make a list of them. And it's sort of a useful feature, if you like, being able to actually hide those types, um, obviously um, at your discretion. Obviously, for effects, you use effects, which means wrapping your functions and functions. Cool, whatever. Uh, either surface your errors or don't. An holistic approach does kind of help you. All, all locks in practice. I mean, I'm kind of running out of time here. Um, I've, run out, ra I've run out of time. You've already seen it, basically. I mean, you know, that's the gen servers and things, so let's not worry about it too much. Um, I guess the structure of the application is kind of important. Get out of this. 
This is a real application that's on GitHub. It's called Demo PS on the Ideas repo. The link's in the presentation. It's got a rebar.config, which calls this make file here, which builds a server which is an application written in PureScript, it's just here. It's got a client, which is an application written in PureScript for the client side, it's just here. And the twos get built, the Erlang gets generated, and the application is just this thing here, which loads the PureScript. And the rebar three tooling works, and the PureScript tooling works, everything comes together, and everything's very nice and shiny. You can go look at that in your own time. Um, just be aware that pure role dependencies can have Erlang dependencies. So for example, Stetson, which is our wrapper around Cowboy, um, <laughs> good name, um, needs the Cowboy dependency adding to rebar.config. Our JSON compiler, simple JSON, requires JSX adding to the rebar compiler. But um, the, the, the thing is, um, Ah, my mouse stopped working. My mouse driver keeps crashing, so I've got a bash script called reset mouse, which brings it back sometimes, but not this case. That's okay, because I've got, I've got Vim. Ignoring that completely. There. I can see into the future. So, uh, <laughs> there is no Elixir style get up and go story. The best way is to clone that demo repo and then delete the code you don't want. Uh, but it's no worse than Erlang's getting started story, really, because that's also pretty terrible, so don't worry about it. Dependency management is ugly. But your Erlangs, so your dependencies are limited anyway. There's like five of them in the world um, that you actually want to use. And package managers are kind of dreadful anyway. Anyone who says is a, is a liar and a charlatan. Um, but it's here, and it works, and we're using it to build real software today. So I mean, it is there. It's great um, for what it is. And here's a pile of useful links that will be available. Um, exactly, take a picture, but the, the slides will be online anyway, or already are online if you know where to look. Um, and that's it. Questions for the demos? Well, I haven't got time for that. See me outside, and perhaps I'll just show you some real code rather than demo code, because I've got lots of it. Uh, thank you very much for coming.